Okay, so the plan for the rest of the week is this, guys. Today we're going to cover cell theory. That's probably all we'll get through. I don't think we'll get to microscopy, and that's all right. Okay, we're going to go through cell theory, and then we're going to, um, tomorrow, work on our toxin projects that I introduced on Friday. Thursday, sorry, yeah, Thursday we'll work on our toxin projects. Friday, we'll continue with microscopy and do the pre-lab for our microscopy lab, which will be on Monday. Okay, so we'll have our first lab for this unit um, on Monday. We're looking through the microscopes, okay, uh, and doing that. So that'll be our first lab and lab report, obviously, for this unit. Okay, so got to start off with kind of a similar theme to the first unit, okay? In the first unit, we talked about the basic unit of chemistry, the atom. Okay, we're going to talk about the basic unit of biology, the cell. Okay, and we're going to talk about the cell theory, kind of how our ideas of how living things operate and, and stuff like that okay, um, today. So we've got to know the points of the cell theory. So there's a cell theory like there was an atomic theory. Good news, the cell theory only has three points. All right, the atomic theory had four. Okay. Um, we've got to know who contributed to the development of the cell theory. Also good news, not as many people as the atomic one. Okay, because we had to know Dalton, Thompson, Chadwick, Rutherford, uh, Bohr, and de Broglie in chemistry. And this one, we only have to know four people. Okay, um, so that's less people to know. Okay, and then recognize the implication of the similarities between plant and animal cells in terms of evolutionary relationships. Okay, we often look at plants and animals and say, wow, they are so different. Okay? But in actual fact, when you look at plant cells besides animal, beside animal cells, there's more in common than there is different. Okay? There's a lot of basic processes and structures that are similar between all living organisms, because all living organisms are made of cells, and come from a common ancestor okay? in the very, very distant past. Okay? All right, so looking at this picture here, what kind of cell would that be? Plant or animal? Plant. That's a plant cell. Okay. Now, it's a plant cell because plant cells typically have a more defined slash rigid shape. Okay. And it has a chloroplast in it, which carries out what process? Photosynthesis. Okay, so this is a plant cell. Okay, I wouldn't see a chloroplast in an animal cell. Animals don't carry out photosynthesis, so they don't have it. Okay, but the other structures, there's a lot of things that are the same in an animal cell. Okay, both plants and animals have a nucleus. Okay, both plants and animals have smooth endoplasmic reticulum and rough endoplasmic reticulum, and they both have a Golgi apparatus, and they both have mitochondria, and they both have a cell membrane. There's far more alike than there is unalike. Okay. All right, so cell theory goes like this, okay? Um, actually, let me ask you this question first. Uh, in order for something to be considered alive, what are some things it should be able to have or do? Just brainstorm. A living thing has to be able to... Okay, exchange gases, for sure. Yeah, not all, not all things breathe, but all things respire. Okay, what else? Consume energy. Yeah, we've got to have a source of energy. We've got to metabolize that energy. And usually when we do that, we produce waste products. Okay, so we have to be able to excrete wastes. Okay. Odd. Usually the first thing I get when I ask what do all living things have to be able to do, people say reproduce. I don't know why, because mine's making better than anybody. Okay, um, that's usually the first one I get. Reproduce is also okay, a key characteristic of a living thing. So we got to exchange gases, consume energy, okay, kind of burn that fuel, produce waste products, and reproduce. Anything else? I'd say that's a pretty good list. If those five things make you a living thing, fire is alive. Fire consumes fuel. Fire converts that fuel by using oxygen. It produces carbon dioxide and ash as a waste product. 
sparks can travel to new places and ignite new fires. That would be reproduction. Okay? It can do all of those things. It's not alive. It's a chemical reaction. What makes a living thing different? What does a living thing have that fire doesn't? Cells. Cells. Okay? All living things are made of cells. Now, at this point, is a virus a uh, living thing then? There's a lot of debate about it. Viruses are not cells. And here's the really weird thing. After the last two years of COVID and everything, we learned a lot about viruses. Viruses do not consume energy. Viruses do not produce waste products. Okay? Viruses do not convert energy from one form to another. And they can't reproduce on their own. They actually hijack your cell and force it to make copies of themselves. Your cell actually does all the work for a virus to reproduce. So a virus has less of the requirements of a living thing than fire. Okay? And they're not made of cells. Okay? A virus is usually an envelope of proteins or a capsid okay, surrounding a piece of genetic material. Okay? The way that they live is they attach to a cell and they inject their DNA inside it. Okay? That DNA is, uh, is immediately recognized by the cell as genetic material and it's brought to the, um, it's brought into the nucleus where all of your cellular um, genetic material is kept. And then what it does is it writes itself into your DNA. Okay? And then as a result of now being part of your DNA, your cell starts making viruses. Okay, so if, for example, in your DNA, there'd be sections that would code for making certain things. So let's just say that there's a section that codes for making insulin, because there is. Okay? The viral DNA will cut that part out and splice itself in there. Right? So now your cell goes, oh, we need insulin. It goes to the nucleus, asks for insulin. Insulin sends out the, or the nucleus sends out the instructions for insulin. Except, what did it send out instead? What's there now? Yes. The virus is DNA. So now, instead of making insulin, your cell makes a virus. And then, what makes it worse is, the cell didn't get what it wanted. So it signals back to it, hey, I want insulin. It sends out another one. What does it do? It makes another virus. Hey, are you not listening? And it just keeps going and going and going until the cell fills up with viruses and pops. So you go from having one virus to having hundreds to even thousands of viruses getting out of that cell. Okay? That in and of itself isn't the bad part. Okay? The bad part is that some of those viruses are going to attach to other cells and they're going to take them over and they're going to make them do the same thing. Okay? That's why you can go to bed at night and you've got like, oh, I've got a little tickle in my throat. I hope I'm not getting sick. And then the next morning you feel like you have to get better to die. Okay? Because it just it happens that fast. Right? You get that exponential growth. One cell makes hundreds or thousands of viruses. And even if only a few of those are successful at infecting another cell, it doesn't take long before they're everywhere. Okay? Now, why does a virus kick your butt so bad? Why does it make you feel so awful? I mean, it's not really, it's not releasing any toxins. It's not really doing anything. It's just there. And it's making copies of itself. Why does that make you feel so rotten? Because it has, like, bad bacteria in it. Like, just bad stuff in it. Um, a little bit of the breakdown could release some toxic materials. But the biggest part of it is your body has to kill its own cells to get rid of it. Okay? Little individual viruses are so small that your immune system can't hunt individual viruses down in your bloodstream and in your tissue, nor would it be any use to try. They're only a problem if they're attached to a cell. So your immune system goes, that cell's infected. Kill it. Sorry, bud, you gotta take one for the team. Okay? You're infected, now you gotta go. Okay? And that's why you feel so drained. Your body's destroying its own cells to make you better. Okay? A bacteria makes you sick entirely differently. So if you've ever got food poisoning, okay, that's a result of bacteria. Bacteria, as a, as a waste product, produce toxic chemicals that make us feel sick. That's why bacterial infections often feel different than viral infections. 
Bacterial infections usually result in a lot of inflammation in one area, or they result in like violent nausea and things like that, whereas viruses don't always do that. Viruses just take you down. Okay, does that sort of make sense? Okay, but that's why we don't consider why viruses don't really fit the bill for being a living thing. They don't have cells, and they don't do a lot of the things that cells do. Okay, so the points of the cell theory are, point number one, all organisms are made of cells. Some things are unicellular, one cell. Some things are multicellular, more than one cell. Can't get a question. Is that it? Okay, so all living organisms are made of cells. Kind of like the first point of the atomic theory. All matter is made of atoms. Well, all living things are made of cells. Second point talks about what cells do. And this is probably the most important or most applicable point of the cell theory, at least from what we're going to do in this unit. Cells carry out the basic functions of the organism. That would be you know, um, cons you know, converting food into energy, okay? getting rid of wastes, detoxifying poisons, um, making, you know, making and repairing things within the body. All of those are basic functions that the cell carries out at a very tiny level. Okay? You just have billions of them, so they can do a lot when they work together. Okay? And the third point of the cell theory talks about where cells come from. Cells come from the division of cells that already exist. You do not have a cell factory in your body that pumps out new cells. Okay? A cell comes from the division of an existing cell. Okay? So the person you are, the collection of cells that you are right now, came from one cell. Okay? So when sperm met egg, okay, the day that that little fertilization thing happened for you, okay, you were a single cell. That cell divided over and over and over again okay, to produce you. Okay? So over nine months, okay, that cell continued to divide. But at the moment that sperm and egg met, all of the DNA was there to make you. The genetic potential for you was present at that moment. Okay? So you know that is the reason why the Catholic Church believes that abortion at any point is sinful. Okay? That is why. Because the potential for you is present at that moment. Okay? And it is at that moment that you become the person. Okay? That's, that's the, the standpoint of the church. You can agree or disagree with that, but that's the explanation for why they feel the way they do and why they say that. Okay? At that point, the genetic potential is there. The, the sort of gift of God or the soul is there because the genetic potential for you is there at that moment. Okay? That's why they have that standpoint. Okay? Does that sort of make sense? Again, you can agree or disagree with that, but that's why. Okay? I don't know if that's ever really been explained to you guys before, but that's Okay. All right. So those are the three points. Did you know those? Could that be like Thursday quiz material? Yeah, definitely. All right. So in terms of the development of this cell theory, okay, the kind of timeline for this. So back a long time ago, 1665, there was a physicist named Hooke. And he was doing an experiment with lens systems. He was seeing what would happen if he put different lenses in a series. What could he do with the light? And what he found was, if he put lenses in the right series, he could greatly enlarge the things he was looking at. Okay? Because what would happen okay, is, and this is going to be simplified to a single lens, just so it's kind of easier to imagine. Okay? So if I've got my lens here, and I've got whatever it is I'm looking at right here, okay, so the light's going to come from this specimen. Right? And when it hits the lens, it bends, because the lens is curved, and it's made of a different material. It's not air, it's glass. Okay? And that bending results in this. Okay? The one bit of light that comes straight on goes straight through, but the ones that come in at an angle do this. Okay? Now, what that does is it flips this organism over. Okay? And I wonder if I can be really tricky and do this. Oh, shit. No, I can't. Smart 
reports are awesome. Oh, but it took it from there. Okay, now it's supposed to keep it down there. Okay, so now what's what's happened is, okay, um, let's see if I can do this. I'll just copy it. Put it back down there so you can kind of see what I mean here. This is ending up being way more fun than it's supposed to be. Okay, so we go from having something small, like this, okay, as it goes through the lens, it gets greatly enlarged because the light is diverged by the lens. Now, that does end up flipping the object over, so what we see is actually inverted from what was actually there, but it is greatly enlarged. Okay, so Hook, completely unintentionally, developed the most important tool biology has, the microscope, as a physicist. Physics. We're, we're the most important science, just so you know. Okay. Physics discovered the atom, without which there would be no chemistry. Physics developed the microscope, without which there would be no biology. Okay. Physics is the most important science. Remember that when you're picking your sciences for grade 11, physics is the most important one. Okay. All right, so this is what happens. Now, that makes, obviously, the microscope pretty important because now we can see things that are not visible to the naked eye. So Hook, and just kind of playing around with his new toy, okay, um, took a piece of cork. I don't know whether he drank or what, but like, he had a cork, and he sliced it really thin, and he stuck it under the microscope. And this is what he saw. What's cork come from? comes from trees, cork trees, okay? So when they make a cork for a wine bottle or something like that, it comes from a tree. Now, now they're mostly synthetic, but back in the day, they would have come from a tree, okay? Um, and so what's left in that cork are the cell walls of dead cells, and that's what we saw, okay? All of these are the cell walls of dead plant cells, which is why he gave them the name cells. They look like empty little rooms, you know, like a room in a prison cell. Okay, so that's why they got the name they get. Obviously, they're not empty. He was a physicist. He didn't know that. He was, oh, look at this. I made a finger. Okay, it's awesome. Okay, um, but it was still an important milestone. He was the first person to view cells. Okay, he didn't even really know that at the time, but he was the first person to view cells. That's what makes him important in the development of the cell theory. Okay, so Hook, first person to view cells. Now, once that was developed, people started making all kinds of different models of the microscope. Some caught on, some didn't. I mean, his is generally what microscope today looks like. Okay? But a guy named Leeuwenhoek, this dude, developed this microscope, which worked a lot differently. It looks like a ping pong paddle. Okay? But what it essentially is, is the lens, and you put the specimen on top of this holder, and then you hold it up to the light, and the light goes through the lens, and, and you put it on the wall behind you. Okay, so the lens is allowed to blow something up over a greater distance, which means it could magnify a lot greater, but it was incredibly difficult to use. It was very finicky, and you had to have a great light source in a dark room okay, um, in order to really make it work. So it didn't catch on, thankfully. Okay? Um, but it did do um, something that hooks couldn't. It magnified far greater. Okay, because of that distance. All right, now, because of that, Leeuwenhoek was able to view living cells, something Hook never saw. He looked at cork and then went, here you go, I'm done with this. Okay? But Leeuwenhoek was a biologist as well, so he was looking at living cells. So he was looking at blood cells, things that are in pond water, sperm cells from a bull, don't ask me how he got those. Okay? Um, but yeah, he was looking at all of those things. Okay? So all these things that were alive. And he realized, hey, Cells aren't empty. Hook was wrong. He said cells were empty little rooms. They're not empty. There's lots of stuff in there. Okay? And they, they reproduce. They split in half. He observed all of that. Okay? All right, so Leeuwenhoek, okay? also important. Okay? And we only need last names. Okay? In science, we only concern with last names. So Hook, Leeuwenhoek, and then the two Swedish scientists, 
Schleiden, and Schwann. Okay? They're the ones who actually came up with the original cell theory. Okay? They built on the work of these other people. Okay? They had better equipment, could magnify up to 600 times. Okay? And what they were doing was, their hypothesis was the original cell theory. And that is that all living organisms are made of cells. So what they did is they looked at tissue samples from a huge variety of organisms. They looked at animals, plants, fungi, okay? um, you know, organisms that are like protists. They live in pond water. They looked at all kinds of different organisms. And what did they find? In every single living organism, there were cellular structures. Every living thing was, in fact, made of cells, and that they came up with that original cell theory. And then in all those observations, they observed what cells do, which added on the second point. They carry out the basic functions of the organism. Okay? And they also realized that cells reproduce by splitting in half. Okay? That's the third point of the cell theory. Okay? Cells come from the division of existing cells. Okay? So that process is very important. OK. Questions on that? All right. Um, okay, so plant and animal cells. We put them side by side. Okay, there's obvious differences. Okay, plant cells are, you know, got their got a cell wall, rigid shape. Animal cells tend to be kind of irregular. But do they have a lot of the same structures inside? Okay, so just visibly. They have a lot of similarities, a lot of similar structures. Okay? But as I said before, that doesn't even scrape the surface. There are the processes that are going on that we can't see in a diagram that are also similar. How cells make proteins, it's the same for all cells. Okay? Um, how cells copy their DNA, same for all cells. Okay? Um, a lot of those processes okay, are the same. So like cellular respiration, how sugar is converted into energy, that's the same for all cells, including plants. Okay? They can just make their own sugar with photosynthesis. Okay. So lots and lots of similarities. Now, there's two possibilities for why that is. They evolved identical structures miraculously separately, or they had a common ancestor who had all of these things and diverged from that. Which one seems more likely? The common ancestor. You don't look like your parents by accident, okay? It's because you share a lot of genetic material. Now, is there likely out there somewhere at your doppelganger? Yes, everybody's got a doppelganger somewhere, okay? But while that person may look like you, how much genetic material do they share? Assuming this person is not a lost twin. Well, not a lot. I mean, there's always some similarities in, in but. You know, now with genetic stuff, they can say there's a one in like a trillion chance that this is not this person's DNA. Okay? Your doppelganger might look like you, but they're not going to have a lot genetically in common with you. If you were to run a southern block like they do for DNA testing for you know, crime scenes and stuff, you would have very little in common. They would know you weren't related. Okay? But if I did that test with you and your parents, well, you'd have half your DNA in common. Okay? So the fact that these two organisms have so much in common is because they got it from a common ancestor way, way, way in the distant past, okay? like three billion years ago. Right? It's been a long time that life has been evolving on Earth. Okay? So lots and lots of similarities because they came from a common ancestor. And we are going to, at one point in this unit, go over evolution. Okay? Um, and that's not contradictory to what you learned in religion class. Right? Um, Pope Francis has unequivocally stated the Catholic Church's position on evolution is that they totally accept it. Okay? Um, there was for a long time the idea that they didn't, and for a long time that idea was the truth, okay? that the Catholic Church did not like that. But we've, uh, we've come a long way. Pope Francis is a very liberal guy, and he's also a scientist, believe it or not. He actually has a degree in chemistry, okay? so he is a science person. Um, but yes, the Catholic Church is no longer opposed and hasn't been opposed to the idea of evolution for a very, very long time. Okay? The Church's standpoint on evolution is this. God knew the world would change, and thus he had to give life on earth the ability to adapt to it. Okay? Evolution is the process of life adapting to changes in its environment. Okay? So that would be smart. 
for God to think of that, okay, and allow life to adapt and evolve and change, because the earth is definitely going to change, and he wants life to stick around. Okay. All right, what do we got here? Thirty-one. Okay. Um, okay. Um, we'll talk about microscopes on Friday. Okay. Um, but just a couple of things about the microscope. Um, so the ones we have here uh, come. In, we've got two different models. Um, so. They all work generally the same. You have two different knobs for focusing. One focuses a lot, and the other is a fine focus knob, so for really, really touchy small work. Um, they all obviously have the eyepiece and three lenses, okay. um, but we'll go through kind of the use and handling and stuff like that. The big thing is, is that we have to handle them with care. Okay. They are an expensive and delicate instrument. Okay. So they should always be carried with two hands. Okay, from place to place. They should always have the dust cover on them when they're put away. Um, you always want to start with the smallest magnification. People think that, you know, oh, I'll just put the slide under there, switch it right to high and find something. No, you won't. Okay, um, That would be like trying to find your friend at a Flames game when they're not sitting anywhere near you just by going, oh, all right, I'll find them. Okay, You're not going to do that. Okay, Even if you have, especially if you had like a telescope. Okay. If you're going to find your friend and you have no idea where in the crowd they are, how long is it going to take you to check every person? 18, 19,000 people can take you a long time. Okay. Um, so you don't want to start on the highest magnification. Okay. If you want to start generally, maybe your friend tells you I'm wearing a bright yellow shirt. Well, if I'm looking at the crowd without a telescope, I might find a bright yellow shirt fairly easily, and then I would know I probably want to look at that before oh, that wasn't then. There's a bright yellow shirt over there. Okay, then I could magnify that one, and I'd have a better chance. So we start looking at a broad stroke, and then we kind of close in as we go. Okay, and I'll, I'll show that a little more uh, in the coming days. But let's call it a day there. My voice is getting better. 